A tributary of the Schuylkill River, the Wissahickon Creek winds through Montgomery and Philadelphia counties in eastern Pennsylvania. The creek forms the backbone of an extensive park system over much of its length, disguising the significant role it played in developing industrial Philadelphia. From a modern perspective, it is one of the region's lucky creeks as it did not wind up in a pipe beneath a street carrying the city's sewage. Quite the opposite, a natural Wissahickon Creek eventually came to be seen as an essential component of Philadelphia's drinking water system. Over time, the area surrounding the creek has become very developed and urbanized. This widespread development has had negative impacts on water quality, wildlife, and recreation. The Wissahickon Creek is considered impaired by Pennsylvania state agencies. Local municipalities are working to collectively improve the health of the Wissahickon. Despite being affected by widespread development, much of the immediate area around the stream has been preserved. So it is a pretty stream, flowing first through the gentle hills of Montgomery County before entering a steep gorge inside the Philadelphia city limits. The landscape of the Lower Wissahickon appealed to 19th century romantic sensibilities at the height of the Industrial Revolution, which no doubt helped with its preservation. This is the story of that early industrial age and how it relates to the contemporary efforts to preserve the natural environment. This diminutive creek and others like it powered the region's manufacturing and set Philadelphia on a path to become a major commercial center. This is the story of the water-powered mills of the Wissahickon Creek as seen through the workings of a survivor, the Evans Mumbauer Mill. The number of factors that came together to give rise to the Wissahickon Mills and to cause them to flourish over about a century and a half or even a little bit longer than that. One of them had to do with the extraordinarily rich soil in the counties surrounding Philadelphia, and that was true of Montgomery County itself. This was one of the bread baskets of the colonies, and grain is going to be ground into flour. It's going to be shipped up and down the coast. It's going to be shipped to Europe. It's going to be shipped down into the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the largest city in North America and the second largest English-speaking city in the world, just second to London. And in 1850, Philadelphia had 400,000 people who needed to be fed. So you have a market there, you have this rich soil, and then you also have Philadelphia being located just below the fall line, that is where the coastal plain butts up against the Piedmont. And these mills are in the Piedmont, that is in the foothills of the Appalachians. The Wissahickon Creek, which begins at Montgomeryville, falls about 335 feet from the source down to the mouth of the Wissahickon at East Falls. It also is a creek that flows downhill rather gently. In other words, there aren't any large cascades or anything like that. So it was easy to dam, to throw dams across. And they wanted to dam it up to about eight feet so that they could harness that gravity actually of water going down. The mills are going to be positioned around certain places that is wides where the embankment was wider where they could actually build a mill. And there was building material, of course, in the Wissahickon Schist that cropped out all over the Wissahickon down in this area. And above here, of course, there's limestone and then there's the so-called mudstone. There were about 50 of them altogether, not at the same time. Uh, there were about two dozen between Northwestern Avenue and East Falls, and maybe another 30 or so from here up into Montgomery County. So there were more in Montgomery County, and they were not only along the main stem of the Wissahickon, but they were along some of the larger tributaries. Of the 50-some mills that once operated in the Wissahickon watershed, only three remained standing. Two, the Springfield Mill in Morris Arboretum and the Evans Mumbauer Mill in Upper Gwanted continued to operate as public displays. The Mather Mill building in White Marsh currently stands idle. When the Wissahickon Park was built, all the mills within the city were torn down. They had been superseded by much larger steam-powered factories on the banks of the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers and were seen as sources of pollution. A few millers' homes and outbuildings survive. In Montgomery County, the mills simply deteriorated and were torn down as they became hazards. 
All along the creek and its tributaries, traces of the walls, raceways, and dams can be found. Some dams are intact, and some have been rebuilt, though not recently. Taking the place of a sawmill in the same location, the evans Mumbauer mill ground grain from 1747 until 1930. Over that time, it was rebuilt more than once and refitted as technologies changed. The mill switched from water to steam power at some point after 1858, a sign of falling water levels as the area developed. After 1930, the mill deteriorated and barely escaped the fate of its companions up and down the creek. Wissahickon Trails, formerly known as the Wissahickon Valley Watershed Association, is a nonprofit conservation organization whose mission is to protect the land and waterways of the Wissahickon watershed. They understood the importance of the old mill and acted on it. We acquired the mill from an organization which was then called the Pelements and Historical Society, and they had taken possession of the mill um, at the request of John and Claire Betts. Some restoration had been done by the Pelements and Historical Society. They had repaired the roof. This building was without half of the roof for many years, and consequently much of the wood framing had been um, rotted away and much of the building had fallen into the basement. So we had a lot of um, new framing put in, a lot of uh, many of the joists that you see in the mill today, the floor joists are, are new. We had to put in a lot of new windows. We did some plaster work. Um, and then of course we had to repair and really replace a lot of the mechanical parts of the mill. In subsequent years, um, the Betts family also increased the endowment by another half a million dollars and also paid for the reconstruction of the, what we call the annex or the, the entrance way where you come in. And um, that was there, but also had pretty much collapsed and only the foundation walls were there when we got the building. The two types of mills would be merchant mills and custom mills. A merchant mill was a larger operation. It brought grain from different sections and milled grain for export to the Caribbean or to South America or to Europe. Those were highly regulated, very structured. The custom mill was a, a local mill that served the local population. So it was, uh, it was less of a business and more of a partnership with the community. Mills harness the flow of a stream to turn a wheel. The potential energy of a stream is increased by damming it and creating a pond. This builds up the available pressure as well as offering protection against a dry spell. The water pooled behind the dam travels through a waceway to the water wheel. Only traces of the dam, ponds, and raceways associated with the evans Mumbauer mill remain. None of the dams along the modern Wissahickon Creek are attached to mills, though most originally were. Dams are generally detrimental to the health of a waterway, so building them is now highly regulated. One of the functions of the evans Mumbauer mill is to promote the health of the local waterways, so rebuilding the mill dam and raceway is neither desirable or feasible. Instead, water flows from an electric pump through a short raceway over the wheel and back to the pump in an endless loop, allowing the physics of the mill to be demonstrated without impacting the creek. The miller starts the day prepping the millstones. A layer of grain is spread on the bedstone, which does not move, and the runner stone is craned into place over it. An iron in the center of the runner stone rests on a spindle protruding through the bedstone. The layer of grain, in this case corn, begins the process of setting the distance between the stones, a distance that can be fine-tuned with a screw and lever mechanism. A wooden casing surrounds the stones to contain the flour which will drop through an opening in the floor. A hopper is placed over the stones along with a shoe which shakes the corn into a hole at the center of the runner stone. When all is ready, the sluice gates are opened and the water wheel sets the runner stone in motion. 
This is the heart of the milling operation, and prior to the late 18th century, it was the primary use of the power generated by the water wheel. The rest of the milling process was done manually until Oliver Evans changed everything. Oliver Evans was not related to the Evans in the name of this mill. That was Thomas Evans, who was granted the property in 1698. Oliver Evans was the rather grumpy father of automation, an inventor who created the concepts modern manufacturing is based on. The restoration of the machinery in this mill is a work in progress. In its present state, it has some of the pieces of the Oliver Evans automated mill, but they have not all been connected together as they were when the mill was a commercial operation. Evans automated his mill using elevators scoops mounted on leather belts to carry grain upward. Gravity moved the product down and Archimedes screws were used to move it horizontally. Evans wrote an engineering manual which showed how to calculate everything from the size of a mill pond to the design of the necessary gears, the Young Millwrights and Miller's Guide. The water wheel turns a heavy oak horizontal shaft. That horizontal rotation is converted to vertical rotation through a lantern gear. All the power needed for milling operations is drawn from this vertical shaft as it extends through the three floors of the building. The first use of that power is turning the grinding stones. On each floor of the building, a central rotating shaft drives the auxiliary operations. As it rises through the building, the shaft's diameter decreases in proportion to the strains placed on it. At the water wheel, the shaft must bear the stress of all the machines in the building but at the top level it only needs to power the operations on that floor. At Evans Mumbauer, most of the auxiliary machines have yet to be connected, but the hoist to lift bags of grain into the building is working, providing an example of what could be accomplished with ingenuity, wood, rope, leather, and a knowledge of simple machines. On the second floor there is a gear powering a horizontal shaft and a slack drive belt. Pulling a control rope that runs through a pulley system to a lever tensions the drive belt and sets the winch drum in motion, winding in the lifting rope. When the bag reaches the second floor, the miller releases the control rope, lowering the tension lever and stopping the lift. To prepare for the next lift, the miller simply pulls on the lift rope, unwinding it from the winch drum. Historically, the Evans Mumbauer mill ground a variety of grains such as wheat, rye, oats, and corn. Now, for demonstration purposes, they grind corn. When the mill was fully automated, the complete process was as follows. After hoisting the bags to the second floor, an elevator takes the grain to the attic where it is dropped into a grain cleaner on the second floor. This separates any undesirable substances from the product. If the product is corn and it arrived on the cob, it first passes through a sheller and then on to the cleaner. Here a volunteer powers a hand crank sheller. From the cleaner, which is difficult to see behind all the wooden ducts going to and from it, a second elevator takes the grain back to the attic where it drops into a bin on the second floor. From there, gravity takes it to the millstones to be ground. The stones are set up to drop the ground grain into a chute in the basement. At the moment, the corn is bagged by hand there, but when fully operational, an elevator carries it to the attic once again. A hopper boy spreads the grain to dry, then sends it down a chute to the bolter, where it passes through a series of sieves and drops through chutes into bags. The cobs separately pass through a crusher. They have value as animal feed. All that is left is to repair to the office and settle up the bill. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, the miller kept the percentage of the ground grain. Later transactions were handled in cash. The account books left with the mill give a record of what the local farms were producing, as well as insights into the business of milling. Working in a mill was a very difficult and dangerous occupation. What you would find if you were running a grist mill in the 1800s is that there would be extremes of weather, you would have a lot of flour dust or, or sawdust, a lot of, a lot of dust, um, fire hazards, you would have uh, machinery, very heavy machinery that you were very close to. A lot of belts were moving, st heavy stones were turning. Accidents were not uncommon. Accidents w were, were pretty much accepted as part of the job. The wheat dust, 
is much more explosive than than the corn uh, dust is, and um, you can't have anything hit against the nails in the floor. One spark and the the place could explode if there's enough wheat dust in the air. They would inhale too much of the uh, of grain dust, and they would die from uh, things like uh, like we think of emphysema because their lungs were loaded with the uh, grain dust. Millers in the 1800s had a reputation similar to what a used car salesman has. <laughs> we know from our records that um, Henry Mumbauer, who was the last miller to run, operate the mill, in his obituary, he was referred to as an honest miller, which I guess at that time was a very high compliment. <laughs> At Wissick and Trails, we aim to engage community members in every aspect of our work. And so one of our key programs is our volunteer program, which engages about 800 people every year. And the mill has a very dedicated community of volunteers that have been involved in the maintenance and care of the mill since the beginning. Um, and we would not be able to do what we do at the mill today without those volunteers. They help, they've helped with the restoration, they help with ongoing maintenance and care, and they help us with our programming. And the programming at the mill is really important because it helps us connect with more people in the watershed, so people with different interests and backgrounds. Um, because the mill programming focuses on the Wissican Creek, but from an historical perspective, rather than say an environmental science perspective, or a natural history or a recreation perspective. And this is important to our mission because we want to engage people with all kinds of backgrounds and interests and get them involved with us and help us achieve our mission. You can see the history in the walls in this building, whether it's etchings in the door, writings on the wall, the uh, David Mumbier's name in the Miller's office. Um, so this was obviously a place for the community to gather even if it was only two or three people. I'm sure that the farmers in all this area knew each other. You know, David Mumbauer worked for the Strasburgers who had that big farm over near Normandy Farm. So, I mean, it's all interconnected. The kids will then uh, compete with the miller um, to grind corn into corn flour. So they start up here, um, the first station in, on this, the stone floor in the mill, the kids will be hand grinding. So they will be using fourth grade muscle, so we're talking about energy here, fourth grade muscle to grind corn into corn flour. It's very, very hard to do that if you ever try that sometime. Um, and they will be using simple machines and they will be using kid energy and simple machines and trying to win a contest with the super miller. The second station the kids will go to is the water station, and we call it the water station. That's what's downstairs with the water wheel. So the water wheel station downstairs, kids will see how water, again, as a source of energy, turns the water wheel. Uh, it's, not, it's not electricity turning that water wheel at this mill. It is water flowing over the water wheel that is turning the water wheel. The kids have studied how the axles and shafts connect to the gears and how energy moves from the basement all the way up to the top of the mill. They see that firsthand, they get to experience that. Then they get to see how water does work. So we'll take a, a smaller child, a slightly more lightweight child, uh, mainly because water, a gallon of water is eight pounds, and the kids are going to use gallons of water to raise that child on a swing. So it's just a little bit faster to do it that way. Um, and we'll get a volunteer to sit on the swing and the kids will take turns pouring water into big buckets that are connected through a simple machine, a pulley system with a child on one side on a swing and empty water buckets on the other side that the kids will pour the water in and pour the water in and pour the water in until they raise the child on the swing, at which point they realize that water did work. Uh, the kids then go around to the creek side of the mill and they learn about um, archaeological work that has been done here. They're in giant kind of wheelbarrows and the kids have to identify whether they have an artifact. Was it made by a human? Did a human intervene in it? Was it a biofact? Is it something that was naturally occurring? For example, a bone, a deer bone. And then they have to categorize them. They'll learn about the science behind it. You have to be able to identify exactly where you got that artifact or biofact by quadrants 
So they'll learn the numbering system, the lettering system, to be able to identify where it was located so that we can go back and um, keep records of what we found and where we found them. So when the kids get a chance to go through first that grinding station that is up here on the stone floor where the millstones are, the water station down where the water wheel is, and archeology span out along the creek, they come back together and we literally weigh the corn. So all the corn that all the kids ground, and they always think 40 kids, 50 kids, we are going to win, we're going to beat the super miller, we're going to grind more corn than the super miller. We gather it all up, put it in a bag, put it on the scale and weigh it. And then maybe we'll have 25, 30 pounds if we're lucky, maybe 32 pounds. That's a lot of corn flour for kids to make. But then the super miller gets up and he has 50, empty 50 pound bags that he used to grind his corn using water energy from the water wheel and the millstones. And he inevitably wins the contest by a lot. While students and visitors experience living history, they also learn that the impacts of mills along the Wissahickon are not entirely a thing of the past. The dams continue to affect our creeks, but continuing development in the watershed has created more pressing concerns. I would say right now the, the dams that remain, their biggest impact would be the blockage of fish passage and other animals, not necessarily fish. But in, in other aspects, the damage or the influences that they had have been or have reached an equilibrium. For instance, sediment, it's a good example. Uh, most of these mill dams are now filled with sediment. They no longer make a big difference or a significant difference in terms of retaining sediment, storing sediment. There's just become part of the river. The increased runoff at the time where mill dams being built was sort of the two punch combination that got these elevated uh, floodplains and sediment accumulation where we are right now. But back to the contemporary times, now we have runoff problems and the mill dams. And they are not necessarily together. We should, there's plenty of reasons to be concerned about runoff and what comes with the runoff and reasons to be concerned about the mill dams, but they, they do not necessarily go together. I don't think with fixing one, you affect much of the other and vice versa. They're two separate problems. And I can even tell you my opinion, the runoff problem is a bigger one than the mill dam problem in many ways. When people experience the evans Mumbara Mill, it's my hope that they leave with a greater appreciation for how integral the Wissickon Creek is to our way of life. It essentially powered the machines of 18th century industry. As a nation, our wealth, growth, and success were built upon leveraging natural resources. And so any threat to those natural resources is a threat to our way of life. Protecting the health and functioning of the Wissickon Creek, yes, it's about the creek, but it's also about us and protecting our quality of life because people benefit when nature thrives. <laughs>